In 1914, war broke out in Europe. It spread throughout the world with unprecedented violence and destruction. The world was never the same again. Today, we look at World War I in Western civilization. The first thing we have to look at is what caused this great war. It started as a very local incident between Austria and Serbity, but it quickly grew into a world war because of the alliance system. That is, Germany was allied with Austria and Italy, and so if any conflict originated between all of those countries, it would soon spread to these three additional countries and all their colonies. Conversely, there was an alliance between France, Great Britain, and Russia. And if they were attacked, all the other great powers on their side would come to their aid. In addition to these two blocks in Europe, which not just included European countries, included all of their colonies, um, there were some informal alliances that we need to pay attention to. Russia, which was Orthodox and Eastern-looking, Slavic, had an informal alliance with the Serbians, who shared a common religion and ethnicity. They're seen as kind of cousins. And Great Britain had a defensive alliance with a tiny little country that was created in the 19th century, Belgium. So if anybody attacked Belgium, Great Britain would come to their aid. In addition to this alliance system, which would cause a small conflict to grow into a global conflict, there was also increased militarism on the eve of World War I. There was a naval arms race between Britain and Germany. These two countries that used to be allies were trying to build bigger and bigger navies to take control of the seas. Armies were increasing in size as they moved towards universal um, male conscription. That is, all men had to serve in the military, and therefore the armies were, were massive. There was also a glorification of war. There hadn't been a major war since the Napoleonic Wars, so therefore nobody had a bad view of war war and they wanted to fight when the when the um when the time came. In addition, there was a great sense of nationalism, this patriotism, this competition between great states, who's the greatest. And there was obviously um places where it was fought out in the uh, in the nineteenth century in the colonies, but it actually hadn't erupted on the European continent for almost a century. But if you have this competition, it's inevitable that uh it might spill over to war. And that is precisely what happened. Um, in 1914. There was internal problems in many of these countries, and particularly in the eastern countries. Um, there was uh, a monarch in control of Austria, Hungary, and Germany, and Russia, and they were unpopular. And what's one of the things that can make you popular? Well, war, and particularly if you win. So these unpopular individuals that were facing a lot of internal pressure thought maybe war was a way to distract the people from these problems. There's also international disputes between these great powers. Um, there was some um, in the colonies, as alluded to in the uh, new imperialism um, lecture, but more so, um, there is problems in the Balkans. This is the place where the Ottoman Empire was. It's slowly receding, and the land that the Ottoman Empire is losing is fought over between the Russians and the Austrian Hungarians, and um, and the, the also the nationalities that are present in the Balkans. So, who is going to control this territory? That's kind of um, being ceded by the Ottoman Empire? Will it be Austria? Will it be Russia? Will it be the local individuals like the Serbians? And so there was a series of wars that were fought over this uh, territory, and obviously this is a hot spot. It's precisely this reason, um, this region, that leads to World War I. The spark was when the heir to the Austrian Hungarian throne. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was visiting uh, Sarajevo, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and this was a territory that was ruled by Austrians, but there wasn't a lot of Austrian people there. Rather, some individuals, the Serbians, thought that Serbians who live there should be ruling the territory. So these are hardcore nationalists. And one individual, Gervilo Princip, was a radical Serbian nationalist. And he becomes involved in a plot to assassinate the Archduke on his visit to Sarajevo. So at first the attempt failed, um, and he was kind of depressed. And then um, as the uh, the driver gets mistaken on where to take the Archduke, um, Princip sees his opportunity, goes forward and shoots the Archduke. 
and eventually um, kills him. Now the question is, was this a lone wolf or was the Serbian government involved? And there was some individuals high up in the Serbian government that were behind it, but their involvement is still a controversy today. Therefore, the Austrians want to get um, to, the, to the bottom of this plot, who killed this high-ranking official, the heir to the throne. But they know that the Serbians have an alliance with the Russians, and they can't fight the Russians by themselves, so they go to the, their allies, the Germans, and the Germans give them a blank check saying, we'll have your back. With German support, they send an ultimatum to Serbia, which was impossible for the Serbians to agree to. It was an attack on their national sovereignty. That is, Austria would have the ability to go in and Serbia and kind of investigate who is behind um, this, this uh, murder. And um, that was uh, a problem. And as this tension is kind of increasing, countries start mobilizing. That means they start calling their troops up. And this is a problem for the Germans because the Germans are surrounded by two enemies. On one side, they have the Russians, and on the other side, they have the French, and they don't want to fight both countries at the same time. So one of their generals, von Schlesien, came up with the von Schlesien pan um, well before World War One, and his idea was to attack France first, and um, Russia is such a large company, uh, country, it would take them years and years to mobilize and bring their soldiers to the front, and so there, therefore um, they would be able to attack France first, and in the months that take um, Russia to mobilize, they'd be able to go and attack Russia after France had been defeated. Now, of course, this is a problem because Russia starts mobilizing and therefore their plan starts to take effect. So Germany responds to this by declaring war on Russia, seeing their mobilization as an act of war. But according to their plan, who do they attack first? Not Russia, but France. So therefore, when they declare war against Russia, they move against the ally of Russia, France. It seems almost a little bit ridiculous. France, seeing that Germany is potentially going to attack them, they call up their soldiers and mobilize against Germany. Now, Germany decides now to attack France according to their von Sleepen plan. And so they declare war on France and um, rather than going directly into France the plan calls for them to go through Belgium and so therefore they unveil Be Belgium. And of course Belgium has a defensive treaty with Britain and therefore Britain um, declares war on Germany. So just to recap there's a very local um, controversy between Austria and Serbia. But Austria calls in its ally Germany, Serbia calls in its ally Russia, the German plan is to attack the ally of Russia, that is France, before Russia, so they attack France first, and they go through an ally of Great Britain, Belgium, to get there, therefore bringing in uh, Britain. So therefore, this very small conflict, kind of almost in a very silly fashion, becomes a, a world war. Now we're at war, and the style of warfare changes dramatically with World War I. There hadn't been a major conflict in Europe really since the Napoleonic Wars. The old style of warfare was you have your two groups of uh, armies facing each other, you shoot a couple rounds, and then you charge across an open field, perhaps aided by cavalry, men on horseback, and break the line. Once the line breaks, you win. Unfortunately, um, the defensive side had a great advantage with the start of World War I and it made attacking across an open field nearly impossible. So there was a defensive system of trenches set up. They would actually dig trenches into the, into the ground. Um, they'd have numerous lines of defenses in between the two trench lines. They'd have no man's land with barbed wire and mines. They would have um, machine guns, automatic weapons set up in the trenches. And it made this style of running across and trying to break the enemy line nearly impossible. So what, instead you have a very mobile style of warfare before with an advantage to the attacker with World War I, you had a very stagnant style of warfare called trench warfare where the advantage was to the defender. You had new weapons that were far more destructive and far more, I guess, um, intimidating. Um, use of artillery was greatly increased. There was um, machine guns and grenades. There was new um, use of airplanes for reconnaissance mainly. Horror weapons were introduced like poison gas and flamethrowers and mines. And at the very end of the war, there's also advent of tanks. This is also an example of total war where you have the mass production of the Industrial Revolution utilized. So you have industries taking over, and rather than producing cars, they're going to be tasting, um, you know, trucks and tanks for the warfare. Rather than producing, you know, a radio, they're going to be taking over um, the plants and 
produce uh, um, ammunition or artillery rounds. And just to give you an idea, during the Battle of Verdun, which was a very long battle, um, there was 32 million shells fired, and that was about 1,500 shells per square meter. It's amazing. There was over 61 million combatants, unprecedented in hu history. And what happens is that um, no side is able to win a direct victory, and it becomes a war of attrition, which means you're just trying to exhaust the other side, beat them into the ground with more and more men, more and more artillery rounds, more and more um, grenades and poisonous gas. Um, and therefore, it's a very destructive war. In order to keep people fighting in such horrible conditions, you need a lot of propaganda. And so you see uh, propaganda on both sides, trying to tell people how evil the other side is and how great they are. And not only is it just a local war, mainly fought in Europe, it becomes a world war when the United States is brought in, um, all the colonies are brought in of these various states, Japan joins in um, on the side of the Allies. And so it's a conflict that spans all the continents, not even though the vast majority of fighting is on the European continent. So let's get to the actual war. It starts in the West. The uh, Germans attack France. Again, they go through Belgium. Belgium fought quite heroically for a little country and kind of stalled the, the Germans. And the Germans were planning on making this big sweeping motion surrounding Paris and knocking France out within a couple of weeks, and if not a couple of months. But they f meet their first defeat, the Battle of the Marne, along the Marne River. And the um, the German advance is halted. And at this point, they try to outflank each other. And it becomes a race to the North Sea, basically. Um, and each flanking movement fails. And you have a stagnant line, a stalemate for the next four years, really, from the North Sea all the way to Switzerland, which is independent. So along northern Belgium and northern France, you have a line. The Germans on one side and the French and their allies, the British, on the other side. And you, they dig in and they have basically trench warfare uh, for the next four years before the line finally breaks at the end. So after the line settles, there's a series of massive attacks um, in 1916. Battle of Verdun is a German attack that lasts numerous months from February to December, almost the whole year. And these battles are pretty epic in size. There's about... Um, 750,000 casualties during the Battle of Verdun. Initially, the Germans were successful, but then they're pushed back by the French. So all this warfare, all these casualties, nearly, you know, a little less than a million casualties, and, you, and nothing really happens. Um, then the British try to relieve some of the pressure on the fr uh, French by um, attacking the Germans directly. They, at the Battle of Somme, they attack from July to November. Um, on the first day, the British lose about 60,000 people in all. Um, the Allies have about 600,000 casualties, and the Germans have about 460,000 casualties, so a little over a million casualties in this one epic battle that lasts months. And it goes to show you again, very little changes, um, even though all these people die, because the advantage is again to the defenders. The attackers can't break through. Well, the Germans realize, realize this in 1970, they fall back and they form the Hindenburg Line, which is a defensive line. They say, we're not going to attack anymore. The British and the French, they're pretty stupid, if you ask me. And they decide to launch another series of attacks. The Nivelle Offense is a French advance. And this, they thought, would be this epic um, um you know, advance with over a million people, tanks, a week-long bombardment. They lost 100,000 people in one week. The French soldiers mutiny. They show up drunk without their weapons. They just realize this is so stupid. Running into machine guns is not really a good strategy. Um, at the Battle of Passchendaele, um, the British try one more time. They have a half a million Allied casualties to about a quarter million German um, casualties. Again, very little gain. And you kind of wonder why this happened. Well, this was the tactic the uh, generals learned, um, just to kind of uh, soften up the other side and then charge. Um, and there was very, very little, um, you know, breakthrough um, in the enemy lines as a result of all this death and destruction. So the Germans kind of wisely shift tactics. They realize that the uh, Western Front is kind of a um, a stalemate, and so they decide to attack Russia. So they launch a major offensive in 1915, and the British and the French try to break through um, the ally of Germany, which is the Ottoman Empire, in the Battle of Gallipoli down south. And this would give them access to the Black Sea, where they could 
bring supplies in for the Russians, but they fail at the Battle of Gallipoli, and that means that the Russians are not going to be supplied, and it's going to be a very difficult situation for the Russians to withstand the Austrian and German attack. Now, Russia is facing a lot of internal problems. They're not nearly as industrialized as the other countries, and so therefore they don't have a lot of weapons, they don't have a lot of ammunition. They're losing the war. Um, so a lot of people start blaming the czars, our Nicholas II. There's riots in Petrograd, in Petersburg. Um, a lot actually of women and other people riding for bread and food because they're starving. And so therefore, uh, when Tsar Nicholas comes back from the front, he realizes he has no support. His, uh, his advisors had left, and the few that remain say that you need to abdicate. So this is the first revolution in, in Russia in 1970. There's two. 1917, February Revolution, very important, is when Tsar Nicholas II abdicates. That means he steps down, and there's a provisional government. That's a liberal government. Um, but the big mistake that they make is that they continue the war effort. Um, the provisional government is very unpopular. Um, there's a conservative coup to bring back the king. That's unpopular as well. Um, and the one group that is a lot of popular support of the Bolsheviks. They're socialists. They're communists. They're led by Vladimir Lenin. And they have a lot of support in the military. They have a lot of support in the working class. And they lead the second revolution called the October Revolution. So this is the revolution where the provisional government is overthrown and the Bolshevik communist under Lenin come to power. So he seizes power and he ends the war. He says, you know, he promises peace and bread, very, very popular with the uh, lower class. And um, Russia is out. Germany had won in the Eastern Front. Lenin didn't really care so much because he thought there'd be a revolution in Germany and they'd kind of have a workers' revolution there and, and reunite with the Russians. Um, and, it, and actually, the, um, the attention in, in Russia is turned inward as there's a civil war between the Reds and the Whites. The Whites uh, are the group supporting the conservative, the monarchs, and the, um, the Reds are the communists. Um, in, the, in the civil war, the communists killed the royal families. Our Nicholas and his, um, his children and his wife are killed. And the Reds win. Lenin um, established control over, over Russia, and you have the first communist country. So Russia's out, but the United States is in. Um, there was unrestricted submarine warfare directed by the Germans. They wanted to knock out the Americans who were supplying the British and other individuals um, with their submarines. But this poses a problem as a lot of American ships are, are sunk. And the uh, United States declares war on April 6, 1917. And um, we enter the war on the side of the Allies. So this very much, by the end of 1917, becomes a war for democracy. Um, Britain, France, and the United States are fighting for democracy. Woodrow Wilson, uh, the president of the United States, has very idealistic aims for the um, for the war. And the other side, Germany and Austria-Hungary, are now monarchs. And so it's a very much a, a war for mo democracy against uh, monarchs. The fresh American troops bring a final um, kind of a new energy to the battlefield. Um, the Germans kind of have an illusion that they might win. They move all their soldiers from the, the um, Eastern Front, from Russia, um, and move them to the Western Front. They have a final offensive. They, they gain a little bit of territory. There's a little bit of a push towards Paris. Um, but that's it. The Allies with the Americans and the British and, and the French counterattack, and the Germans are exhausted. There's a revolution against the German government. The um, Kaiser, um, William II, who is the king, um, of Germany is kicked out, and uh, the new government basically realizes that the war cause is lost, and they sue for peace, and on November 11th, um, 1918, you have the end of World War I. Now, this is a very destructive war in terms of, you know, casualties. Just look at some of the Allied powers. Russia mobilized 12 million. France mobilized 8 million. Britain, 8 million. Italy, 5 million. I should mention that Italy switched sides. <laughs> can never trust the Italians. They'll switch sides on you. Um, they were supposed to fight with Germany and Austria-Hungary, but um, they decided to switch sides. And then you look at the casualties, 9 million Russian casualties, 6 million French casualties, and so forth. 
Um, and then on the central powers, about 11 million and 7 million for Germany and Austria-Hungary, respectively. And they both have around 7 million casualties. Nearly 90% of all the people that Austria-Hungary put in the field ended up as a casualty. In some, you had 65 million mobilized and 37 million casualty. If you look at killed, over 8 million people killed, you know, 20 million wounded, um, 7 million prisoners are missing. It's just astonishing. These numbers are really, really hard to comprehend. The impact is Europe isn't down completely, um, but there is a decline of Europe as the major powers in the world. Um, conversely, on the periphery, the Soviet Union and the United States are coming to the forefront as the key um, players. Um, after the war, the governments of Europe had spent a lot of money um, paying for these wars, and um, there's a lot of unemployment, a lot of debt, a lot of internal economic problems, and Germany and France and Britain as a result of the war. All these people coming back, seeing the horrible, horrible um, environment of trench warfare, this, this death and destruction. It's almost a lost generation. Lots of uh, drama as these soldiers come back, and they just, you know, completely discard their traditional values and have a hard time reincorporating back into society. So after the war, there's a Paris Peace Conference, which opens in 1919, and they were very idealistic. They sought to aim um, to end war and never have a war like, um, like World War I again. Of course, they were unsuccessful. They treated with each of the major uh, countries that were fighting and the central powers and were defeated in, in separate treaties. So Ottoman Empire had lost a lot of, uh, a lot of their territory. For the most part, they become Turkey. And that's the birth of modern Turkey. After this, there's a major conflict between Greece and Turkey for control of some territory. There's ethnic cleansing. There's mass movement of individuals. It's a very kind of a brutal war. Um, and then there's the creation of the modern Middle East. If you're interested in the Middle East conflicts, start with World War I and the Paris Peace Conference. And the Ottoman Empire was carved up, and you have all these new creates. You have the mandates um, that were given to European countries, like France had Syria and Lebanon. And then you had the British mandates, like Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq. And then you had like the Arab states who fought against the Turks and were guaranteed independent states like the Saudi family were given Saudi Arabia. Um, so if you're interested in the Middle East and how it was created, definitely look at the beginning of World War One. And they did a pretty bad job. It was a, a disaster. And it's kind of ever, ever since World War One's been a disaster. So not what to do. <laughs> okay. um, Austria-Hungary is dissolved. Um, you can see Austria-Hungary is a large country in Central Europe is carved up. Austria is pretty small. Hungary is pretty small. They create new states like Czechoslovakia uh, for the Czechs and the Slovaks. They create um, Yugoslavia for the Slavic people, like the um, Serbian people. Um, they create Poland for the Polish people. All of those new countries are um, built on nationalistic principles. Germany was treated with the um, um, Treaty of Versailles. Um, they lost some territory, Alsace-Lorraine. They had to give some territory to Poland. So up on both borders, with France and with the new creation of Poland, they lost some territory. The army was limited to 100,000. They couldn't have an air force. Um, they had to have a demilitarized zone, the Rhineland, which is this area between France and, and um, Germany. They couldn't have a military because France is quite, quite scared of Germany. They had to accept war, war guilt, saying that Germany caused the war. And they had to pay money, reparations, um, to the victors. And the creation was a new republic. They got rid of the monarch, created the Weimar Republic, um, which was ruled by basically social democrats until... Um, um, the Nazis kind of took over the Weimar Republic and created a new um, Third Reich, if you will, um, when Hitler comes to power in 1933. They also created a new um, institution, the League of Nations. This was supposed to be a, a path for a new diplomacy. No more secret alliances, no more um, rushing to war like they did um, with World War One. And so this is supposed to be a more transparent, more open um kind of institution so that these countries would be able to sit down and talk before they went to war. Unfortunately, um, this permanent union of countries was kind of um, problematic because it didn't have a lot of support. The United States, so kind of Woodrow Wilson's idea, decides not to get involved because they don't want to be drawn into any more conflicts. They're very much isolationists. Also, the Soviet Union, which is another great power, does not join the League of Nations. So it's a great idea to end war and to talk before going to war, but this was a very weak institution that had very, very limited powers. So 
So after World War I, you have a new Europe. You have all these new countries in Eastern Europe. You also have a new Middle East. Um, another major change is you have the Soviet Union, a socialist uh, government under Lenin, later in Stalin under Russia. So you have the rise of that ideology as a major political player. The United States becomes a huge influence in the world, though they're still isolationists and like to keep to ourselves pretty much at this time still. Um, and there is some unresolved tension. There's a lot of tension between Germany and all these other countries around them that um, it's going to be, um, you know, a problem. There's economic problems throughout Europe. Um, there's nationalistic problems. Not, none of these countries that they created were truly getting along. Yugoslavia was made up of a lot of different nationalities that hated each other. Um, Poland had a lot of Jews, had a lot of Germans that weren't really happy to live in this new Poland. Um, so the um, attempt for a more peaceful um, a world um, for um, war to be outlawed, well, it was a failure, as we'll see. Um, immediately after World War I, you have a very uh, destabilizing interwar years, and then, of course, you have the horrible event of World War II, which was even more destructive and even more people died. So we'll look at some of these issues in our upcoming lecture.